Hello, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, this time I've invited Ray Sang from uh, Google to reprise a talk that he gave um, in the developer room on microservices and containers at FOSDEM earlier this year on gRPC and microservices. Um, he used a lot of great demos and things I think will be really interesting to all the Java developers and folks using IntelliJ and other things. So um, I'm hoping we can have a good conversation afterwards um, and do some Q&A to pick Ray's brain about this stuff. Um, so without too much further ado, I'm going to let you all ask questions in the chat and we'll try and answer them and we're going to let Ray take it away. All right. Well, for having me, uh, really, really happy to be able to uh, present uh, on this uh, OpenShift Commons briefing. And let me get started. My name is Ray. I am a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. And what that means is I love to bring Google's greatest and latest technology to developers all over the world. But I also like to get uh, your thoughts, your feedback, and um, how you're using our technology uh, today, whether it's the cloud or whether it's the open source projects. So if you have any thoughts, feedback, questions, um, or just wanted to chat or needing help, just uh, ping me on Twitter at Satanism. Okay. So uh, aside from developing, I love to travel. I love to travel all over the world and I love to take photos. And this particular photo is special to me because I was backpacking in Asia, in Northern China. And uh, being a cheap backpacker, I wanted to find some of the, you know, the, the most cost effective place to stay. And there was this one city where they told me I could stay for free if I go to a desert and hike into the desert for about four hours. And I will actually find an oasis with water and I can stay there overnight for free. And, and I don't know if anyone on this call actually hiked in the desert before, but um, it's not very easy, right? Uh, every step you take, uh, you kind of sink into the sand a little bit and you gotta pull yourself out. And you gotta go through the sand dunes, you gotta go up and down rather than going around it because you know when somebody tells you to go into the desert for four hours, uh, you just go in that one direction, otherwise you could veer off. Anyways, uh, it is a very tough um, process for me and um, well, it kind of reminds me of writing uh, J2EE applications back in the day. But the end was beautiful. Once I got through to the Oasis, which I'm happy I found, I was alive. And um, the end is beautiful. A beautiful sunset. Um, and very, I was very, very happy I made the journey. But this is how I look at my job, right? I like to uh, take all of you. I want to take you onto a helicopter and airdrop you into the Oasis, right? Rather than having to go through all the troubles. Um, so let's get started. We have talked about microservices uh, and microservices architecture for the past year, two years or so, uh, very heavily. And uh, we are seeing a lot of adoptions in this architecture uh, today as well. Uh, whether you are migrating to microservices uh, or whether you are creating a new microservices architecture projects, right? Uh, there's one, there are some things that you have to really think about. Uh, well, first of all, if you're breaking things down or if you're just building uh, microservices, right, you will have more and more components you have to manage independently, right? And very importantly, it's you need the resources or the team, uh, the small teams to create and maintain these microservices and operating it, but you also need the technology to be able to uh, keep all of them up and running and actually know what's running in your environment. And with this type of architecture, you will be adding some overhead. And luckily, we have tools that we can use to orchestrate and manage uh, all of the microservices uh, instances that you may actually spin up. So for example, rather than having just two instances of some, something, you may end up with 10, 20, 50, 100 instances of different services. Right? So for that, you can use you know, container technology and container orchestration technology like Kubernetes to help you uh, organize and manage and deploy um, you know as many instances as you want literally however one thing that we don't really think about is how do these microservices communicate with each other we i see it in two 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 types right we have services that you need to consume from the browser right and for that you the browser can only consume rest though that is the default protocol that we use however in between services, we also defaulted 
to using REST or JSON over HTTP uh, to uh, have these inter-microservices communication. But is that really the best way to do it, right? And we really think, need to think about how and why are we choosing and picking the technology and also what type of technologies are available to us. And this is where gRPC come in. And you might be thinking RPC, well, that sounds a little familiar. Uh, I, I think we, uh, we have tried RPC before and I thought nobody liked it. Right? But RPC has been around for a long time uh, in distributed systems from the past. And I don't know if anyone on the call remembers Corba. Uh, Corba is, of course, one of the uh, prominent RPC technology um, where you can define a IDL, so you can define an interface definition language where you can you know, say what it is that you are trying to build, what does the message payload looks like, and it's going to generate a stop for you so you can Im implement it, um, just the, the, the operations you want to implement. Uh, but then I remember that if you want to connect to the server from the client, it's like 100 lines of code or something like that. And it gets, it gets a little um, tricky when you look at RPC and having to go through all the troubles to implement it. Uh, similar things with DCOM, but Java, Java we traditionally had a really good RPC support with RMI. Um, and it's really, really easy to implement an RMI server, an RMI client. However, it is not really interoperable. Now, what happened then next is that uh, we uh, introduced SOAP, right? There was SOAP in the industry, and it is interoperable because we use the most interoperable format, which is literally text and XML, for that matter. And uh, a lot of people think that, well, in hindsight, right, SOAP was slow. SOAP was slow because of all the XML processing we have to put in place. So you couldn't really live up to the, uh, the, uh, the, the problems that they are trying to solve, right? However, um, just like what we have done before, which we defaulted our services to SOAP protocol, today we're defaulting literally to REST, which is JSON over HTTP. But if you think SOAP is slow, right, is REST is actually not much better. I mean, it's definitely better than so, but it is still text-based and you still have to go through the parsing. You still have to go through a lot of marshalling on marshalling. Um, and you still need some kind of definition language if you need to be able to generate the client. So you don't need to write your own client ever again. And so rather than using Wisto in SOAP, we needed to use Swagger, for example, to document and define what does that REST endpoint look like. But why RPC? Uh, well, in addition to performance, uh, RPC is going to be um, more efficient because most of these RPC frameworks are going to be uh, transmitting over a binary protocol. And most importantly, it's going to be strongly typed because you have to define your interface definition language uh, up front. You have to define your message payloads up front, and then the generated stops for you will have uh, strongly typed uh, semantics in there. However, more importantly, uh, when we default something to REST, we are locked in by the REST uh, semantics, which are basically based on HTTP, which are generally CRUD operations, like the, the, the put, the post, uh, the patches, right, the delete. But there's just some operations you cannot simply express in CRD manner. For example, if you need to deduct a balance from an account and transfer it to another account, how would you do that in REST, right? Potentially, you have to modify two resources. And what you end up happening is we will potentially end up with some kind of like a JSON RPC, right? So we are just going back to RPC in one way, one form or another, where uh, we're just using a text protocol to do that. But I think RPC can be really great if it is simple to use, uh, just like RMI, but also interoperable, right? Just like REST or SOAP. And that's what we actually have developed. At Google, we use an internal technology called Stubby. Stubby is what we use for most of our uh, services, uh, for service communication. And in fact, we uh, transmit uh, 10 to the 10 RPC calls per second via Stubby. And that is incredible amount of service calls per second at Google, right? And Stubby is a binary protocol and uh, it is made to be very efficient uh, in case in, in the usage, usages of uh, the bandwidth and all that. 
But just imagine if we use something else that's text-based, the 10 to the 10 uh, RPC per second, uh, we will be using a lot more bytes to transmit that. Even for Stubby, if we just take one more byte than necessary, that will be 10 to the 10 more bytes we have to transmit per second. And that is a mind-boggling amount. So what happened next is that Google wanted to open source Stubby, and I heard this company, uh, Square, wanted to also uh, develop the next generation of their internal uh, RPC framework as well. So the two uh, joined forces and decided to open source uh, this um, gRPC together. So gRPC is really the next generation of Stubby. Uh, it's based on the experiences and the, um, the, the code that we have internally developed, and we open sourced it, and we called it gRPC. The G in gRPC stands not for Google. The G doesn't stand for Google. It's actually a recursive acronym. gRPC stands for gRPC Remote Procedural Code Framework. And it is simple to use, it's performant, and it is also made to be interoperable. And we are able to achieve um, the performance and interoperability by basing it on standard technology and newer technology. So the transport layer of gRPC uh, is not you know, just a straight up TCP socket, right? We, we actually decided to use HTTP2 uh, on top of TCP to uh, provide this um, transportation uh, layer. And why HTTP2? And what is it in HTTP2 that makes it compelling, right? Well, first of all, HTTP2 is binary. Rather than having to uh, transmit, uh, you know, the, the headers or the, the, the methods, whether it's get, put, or post, or what, whatnot, rather than transmitting all of those things in plain text, right, with HTTP2, uh, they can be encoded in binary. So the get, the puts, the, the uh, the deletes, they're just going to be encoded into a binary uh, format rather than uh, you know, the entire string. And the headers are going to be compressed as well. If you ever look at the payload of an HTTP request, what you will find is that sometimes the payload is very small and the header is actually taking more bytes than the payload itself. And in HTTP2, we can compress it with HPAC. Now, more importantly, uh, in HTTP1, we have the issues of, um, you know, keeping the connections alive, right? You can't really do streaming, and if you need to make multiple calls, you gotta do pipelining and all that. In HTTP2, we solve the problem by just, you are able to have a single connection, and we can multiplex multiple streams through the same connection. So rather than having to open multiple connections, you just open one, and, and we can also do streaming. We can do uh, by the uh, streaming from the client to the server and the server to the client, and also both ways at the same time, you can multiplex it, okay? And for the uh, for the payload, we're using Proto Buffer 3, and that is uh, a way for you to uh, basically marshal data into this portable format. It's binary encoded as well, and we can uh, then uh, transmit it to uh, multiple different languages, and every uh, one of them will be able to parse it, okay? And the, there's a quick comparison between the two protocols, right? Uh, there's binary, uh, which is gRPC. Uh, you can see the throughput is, you know, of course, faster than uh, JSON over HTTP. But of course it is faster, right? Anything that's binary that doesn't require a lot of parsing and marshaling, and marshaling is, of course, going to be faster than something that requires it. So that is not so interesting to see. Right? I, would, I would be really concerned if the graph is the other way around. But what's more, most interesting to me, though, is that if you look at the per CPU throughput, uh, gRPC really outshines uh, the, the regular text-based protocols by multiple folds, right? And this is important, especially you're, if you're moving into a cloud-native uh, mode where you want to you know, run your applications in a scalable fashion. And as a cloud provider myself, as a right, I rather than telling you to use as much CPUs as you you want, right? I always argue that you want to use your CPUs as efficient as possible, right? And to achieve that, you have to pick uh, efficient technologies. In this case, gRPC will be uh, really great if you run it on a server side. But not only that, uh, we can also run gRPC clients on the mobile devices. So what that means is, rather than costing the mobile device a lot of CPU cycles to perform the, the parsing and you know, the transmitting uh, textual data over HTTP, uh, you can actually use gRPC and transmitting binary data 
over HDB2 from mobile devices. And the, what that translates to is actually more efficient usages of uh, the mobile device CPU and power for that matter. Uh, here's a quick overview of the languages that we support. And I want you to focus on three, which is Objective-C, C Sharp, and Java. And these three languages are the primary languages that you would otherwise use for mobile development. And gRPC was really made with mobile first in mind. Okay, so enough of the uh, overview and the slides. I'm just gonna go into the code and show you what it feels like uh, to write something in gRPC. So here I have a, um, a bootstrapped project. I have a few demos I can show. Uh, the very first one I wanna touch on is actually uh, a simple, uh, just a uh, simple unary request and response. What that means is all I wanna do is to send in one request and wanna say hello back, right? And we'll see how this works with gRPC. And you can also compare this with other frameworks, uh, whether it's RMI or uh, Corba, if you like, if you still remember how to do that, okay? So with gRPC, the first thing that we needed to do is to define the IDL. Uh, we need to use the IDL to define what it is that we can actually transmit, what kind of service are we going to create? And the IDL is going to be created with uh, with Coto3 uh, language, okay? And so to do that, let me to my, uh, microphone down a little bit. Okay, so to do that, first of all, you gotta create a portal file. And in this portal file, we need to say syntax uh, is equal to portal three. That is because we needed to make sure we're using the portal three syntax. Otherwise it could be using a older version of the syntax. Um, and then just like Java, we can package, you can put classes into specific packages. So can we uh, in gRPC. So we can say something like com.example.grpc, okay? And what that means is, Everything that we define in this IDL, when we generate it, is gonna be generated into the corresponding Java packages. Now, with gRPC, uh, these, this file, this portal file, will have to be compiled, basically, or translated into actual code for the target language. And there is a, what we call a portal buffer generator compiler, or portal compiler, uh, portal gen compiler. Uh, there, they have many names for it. Uh, but through this compiler, you can give it additional options. And so you can specify uh, different knobs when you generate into different languages. So for example, for Java, uh, by default, it's going to generate everything into a single large Java file. But rather than have doing that, what I really want is say uh, Java multiple files is equal to true. Uh, and now what, what I will do is that when the compiler uh, compiles this into Java code, it's going to generate uh, individual Java files for individual classes, okay? So that's just bootstrapping the IDL. The next thing that we needed to do is to define the request and the response, right? So to define the request and response, what we needed to do is to define the message payload. So we can define a message that says, that's called hello request, for example. And what that's going to do is to generate the current bounding POJO uh, code hello request in Java. Uh, in which you can get access to all the properties or attributes that you define in this message payload. And the way you define the message payload is simply uh, define the type that you want to use because everything is strongly typed, this is great. And you can say the name, first name. So I'm defining a, an attribute of first name or a property called first name that is of a string type. And very importantly, you have to give it a tag. A tag is the number that uniquely represents this field in this particular message, okay? And this tag, this number, is actually what's used uh, to be uh, transmitted in the binary encoding of this message, right? So rather than sending the whole text called first name, like we like people do with JSON, right? Where it takes a lot of bytes uh, to transmit over the wire, we just send over the number in binary format. So that will be just one byte to transmit uh, this one number, okay? And so we can say, um, we can define another one. Uh, let's say last name equal to two. I can also use uh, integer 64 uh, for the age equal to three, for example. I don't think anyone would live that long, but I'm just gonna use integer for now. And we can also uh, define uh, enumerations. In Java, we have enums where you can define a set of possible choices for your value. And here in GRPC, I can do a very similar thing. So I can define an enum called sentiment. 
And、uh, this is how we feel right now. I feel pretty happy. So I'm gonna do happy is equal to zero.、Uh, hopefully,、uh, you are not sleepy, but you could be because it is 9 a.m. in the morning. Let's just say sleepy is equal to one.、Uh, by the end of this talk, you could be extremely angry at me for having spent an hour here. So I'm gonna put angry、uh, equal to two. Well, hopefully that's not the case, right? But just in case, just in case, hopefully you choose happy in the end. Okay. So once you define the enumeration, I can go ahead and say sentiment. And sentiment is equal to four. Done.、Uh, I can also use other types. So if I have other messages that I defined, you can think of them as other、uh, structs or other classes. I can just use those、uh, messages nested in, in here as well. So for example, I can say、um, if I define another message called uh, uh, language, I can just use language type here instead. Okay, but I don't have that right now. Um, in addition to some of these basic types, we can also do、uh, a list. So if you have a list of something you want to return, you say repeated.、Uh, for example, hobbies is equal to five.、Uh, sorry, you repeated the string. You need to、uh, strongly type this. So repeated string hobbies is equal to five. And we can also do、uh, create strongly typed maps. And this is quite nice. So if you have a bag or a map or、um, a hash table of something you want to transmit, you can say map. The key type and the value type, and this is very similar to Java, by the way.、Uh, so there should be no problem to just picking this up. Now I say bag of tricks. Okay,、um, live coding is definitely not the bag in my bag of tricks in this case. So once you have defined the request, what you can do is to define the response. So I'm going to say hello response, and I can again define the property, and in this. Part in this message, I can define the tag, and of course, I can use tag number one in this message because they just need to be unique to the message. Okay. Once you have defined the payloads, the request and the response, then what you can do is to define the service. I'm going to call this greeting service, and I can go ahead and implement,、uh, define the operation I want on the service. So the operation is going to be greet.、Uh, in this case, it's going to take in a hello response, and it's going to return a hello. Oh, sorry. I'm going to take in a hello request. As you can see, this is really early for me, <laughs> and I'm gonna take、uh, return a hello response. There we go. Okay. Now,、uh, so this is what we call a unary request. What that means is there's a single、uh, input and a single output, right? You 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 give the server one request, and the server is going to give you one response. If you want to return multiple responses, you can return that in a stream and So what that means is, I can the server can stream the data to the client. So the server can stream the data to the client at will. And to do that, all you need to do is to add the stream keyword. If you are building an IoT device that needed to stream data like metrics to the server, then you add the stream to the request parameters. So in this case,、uh, the client will be able to establish the connection and then stream multiple requests to the server. And in the end, server will give you、uh, one response, or you can return no response if you don't、uh, want to do that. Okay. Okay. So that's good. That's um that's the IDO. And the next thing we need to do is to compile this. Now, usually, what you need to do、uh, in the past is you gotta figure out, okay, am I running on Mac? Am I running on Windows or Linux? And then let me go and download the compiler. Um, the the protogen compiler, and then you have you have to pass in these long and complicated command lines.、Uh, we really streamlined this whole experience、uh, really really well.、Uh, so now all you need to do is、uh, go to GitHub, for example,、uh, and let's find the、um, gRPC. So here's the gRPC、uh, GitHub repository. Okay,、and、if you just scroll down, it actually gives you all the things you need to get started. So because I'm using Maven. I'm gonna go ahead and、uh, first of all add my dependencies. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my Maven palm, and here we go. I'm going to add the dependencies, dependencies, and there you go. But these are just dependencies for the、uh, code to consume because you need the gRPC API. However, in order to、uh, compile this proto file and translating that into the Java code. What we need to do is by using the plugins, and we have plugins for Maven. We have a plugin for Gradle as well.、Uh, I don't know what the breakdown here,、uh, but usually I see 50/50. If you're using Gradle, here's the code. 
that you can use. Okay. And if you're using Maven, uh, here's the code that we can use. So because I'm using Maven, this is what I'm going to use. And I'm going to go ahead and paste it in my palm.xml. Now, this, this little snippet of code does a lot. Well, first of all, it determines which operating system you're running on, and it's going to put it into a variable. And then it's going to be able to download the right binary based on the operating system that you're running. Okay, And then it's going to execute this binary and by, by binding into the different Maven build phases. Okay, So in this case, I'm saying whenever I'm compiling this Java code, I want to go ahead and make sure my proto file is also compiled and so my classes can reference and use it. Okay, so let me try it out. I'm going to go to my here and go to my terminal. I'm going to say maven clean and package. And maybe I made a mistake in my proto file, maybe not. It is early in the morning, but we will find out. Ah, everything worked. Well, that is great. And if I see target and if I go to generate sources, uh, there's a protobuf uh, directory, and here I can go into Java, gRPC, and you can see all of the uh, messages uh, and also the services that I defined, okay? So it generated all the stops and all the produce for me just from a simple IDL. That's good. So let's go ahead and implement the stops. So all I'm going to do is to create a new Java class. I'm going to call this greeting uh, service info, for example. Uh, no, let's not add this to it. Okay, and so for this stop, uh, just like many of the other RPC framework, when you implement this stop, you need to extend or implement an interface, right? You either extend the base class or, or you implement the interface. In this case, we're going to extend a base class that was automatically generated for me, which is greeting service input base. Okay, and this base class actually implemented the greeting method by default. And the default implementation is just going to throw an arrow that says that there's no operation. It hasn't been implemented yet. Okay. So for you to make sure that this works from the client side, you have to implement. So I'm going to say greet. And here's where things get a little tricky. And this is why I'm here, because I want to make sure you have the best experience when you're using this, right? So if you look at our initial definition, it is a request and a response. Now, if you look at the generated stub, it looks slightly different from what I would otherwise um, uh, expect, right? Because usually when you have a request and response, you would say hello response as a return value, you would say greet, and then you will have the hello request in the parameter. But if you look at this implementation carefully, I'm getting the request in the parameter, and I need to respond by using a response observable uh, callback, right? I need to use a stream observer callback. And the reason that we're doing this is because we want to make sure the server side is as efficient as possible. And that's why in the server side implementation, everything needed to be implemented and synchronously. Okay. And because it is an async implementation, so we cannot just do the return uh, in return value because that could potentially be blocking. So rather than doing that, we ask um, everyone to just use the stream observer to pass uh, the, the data back to the client. So this is one of the most important concepts here is by using the stream observer. So I can say um, the name, for example, uh, is equal to, let me say is the uh, get first name um, plus, uh, let's just say get last name, okay? I can say the greeting message is equal to, uh, and say hello, last name. Okay, so you can see the request object has been uh, generated for you that has all the setters and getters uh, and the builder actually. And I can just simply use it. In fact, I can also do something like this. I can say system dot out dot print line uh, the request because we actually implement and generate the two string as well. So you can debug this very very easily. You can log your requests if you want to. And then what we can do is to create a response, right? So I can say, hello, uh, response, response is equal to. Now, the thing in gRPC is that everything uses a builder. Everything is almost immutable. And for you to create and construct a new instance of something, you have to use the builder pattern, okay? So to create a new response, I need to create a new builder. 
So we can say a new builder. In the end, we say build. That's going to give me uh, construct me the actual instance Apollo response. But in the builder, we have all of the same uh, fields that we can actually set. So here I can just say greeting is greeting. Okay. So I'm just setting the response back, and to give it back to the client rather than the return value, we have to use the callback. And this is interesting now because if you see the callback, we have three. There's on next, which is to give a valid response back to the client. We have on arrow, which is if your service ever caught the exception, you can use on arrow to give it to back to the client. And you can also use on completed, which will terminate the string. Okay. And if you look closely on these three methods, this actually closely resembles a reactive uh, paradigm. This is um, pretty similar to RxJava and many of the reactive uh, callbacks that you have seen in the past as well. That is because when you string something here and also asynchronously, uh, this literally is uh, implementing a reactive service. Okay. So I can say on next and the response. Sorry. The response, ready to go. And that will send the response back to the client. However, this is not done yet, right? Because what you also need to do is to terminate this request session or string. So you have to call uncompleted. If you don't call uncompleted, even though the client is only expecting one response, the stream will be held open until you call uncompleted. Okay, so you must do this no matter how you, uh, no matter whether you're returning a string of responses or if you're returning just one. Not only that, when you do, um, if you do string was ever call on next, you can actually call it twice, but that is invalid in this context because you are supposed to only be returning one response. And in this case, we will actually give you a runtime exception. So just be very careful uh, when you work with the API, uh, where you could potentially make a little error like that. Um, just watch out for it. Now we have the service implemented. Uh, all we need to do is to go back and uh, implement a little server runtime to start and listen on a port uh, to respond to the requests. Now, because gRPC uses HTTP2, uh, and HTTP2 support doesn't come into uh, Java until Java 9, and also uh, gRPC comes with a server. So what that means is you don't really deploy the servers into a container, uh, like a web container, right? So you don't really run a gRPC server in Tomcat or Jetty, for that matter. Uh, what you do is to just run the, the Java uh, jar file directly. So you need to implement potentially your own main uh, main methods, right? And then you need to uh, start the server yourself. And so to start the server, first of all, you need to create a new server. And to do that, you can use, guess what? A builder, right? Everything gRPC uses a builder pattern. So I can say, uh, I want a new server that lives in some port 8080 and go ahead and build it. And that's really it. And um, I can potentially assign this to a, um, a uh, a variable. So bear with me with my recently messed up key binding. So I'm just going to click on the UI instead. I'm going to introduce a variable called server. Okay. And then I can add the server's implementation I just created. So I can say new greeting service info. And that's it. So this is interesting too because uh, you just need to give it one implementation instance, right? And you can somehow create this instance with dependency injection or uh, passing the necessary constructor parameters, you can construct this uh, service elsewhere and then pass it in and register it. Okay. If you have multiple services, you can just multiple, you know, register multiple ones. Uh, once you have the service registers and the server built, you have to start it. And what this is going to do is to start in the background threads. Uh, and because it is in the background, if I don't do anything else, this main process which is exit and all the background threads which is die altogether. So we're not really running the server anymore. So what we need to do is to await termination of the server. Uh, so I'm going to block this uh, main methods and that should be it. Now I really took the long route to get here because I want to show all the details of implementing a service, right? But once you get started, uh, just remember, first thing you need to do is defining the IDL. Second thing is make sure you have the palm where you can just generate the stops. 
then you implement it, which is really straightforward, and you, you run the server, and that takes literally a couple lines of code. Okay. Once you have this, and we can go ahead and try to do this uh, to run it. So I'm going to run a command like queued up here. We're going to do maven install, execute, and um, the and the main class I just created. Okay. So let's see if this works uh, in the first try. Okay. So compiling that is good. Executing and this is actually working. All right. This is actually just listening on port. Uh, I'm not clicking anything. That's why you don't see any logs. But this is just listening and waiting for connections. Great. Now the next thing we can do is to implement the client. And the client is really, really straightforward to implement. This is uh, nothing scary. In fact, I would argue this is probably more straightforward than, definitely more straightforward than Corba, uh, potentially even um, as straightforward as RMI, right? This is really uh, easy to implement. So let me show you how this is done. Well, first of all, we need to uh, be able to specify a connection. We need to connect to somewhere. We need to connect to the server. To do that, we need to, um, to specify the, the IP and the port. And rather than having you to deal with the underlying TCP and HTTP2 connections, uh, what we wanted to do is to hide all of these complexity and give you a higher level abstraction called a channel. So I can create a channel uh, via, of course, a builder. Uh, I can say I need this channel to connect to uh, localhost uh, on port 8080 in this case, okay? And because I am uh, running this in development, I don't want to deal with SSL because that could take a whole other hour uh, or of talk time to talk about using SSL in Java. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to say plain text is equal to true, and I'm going to build. Okay. Uh, now look carefully here. Uh, in this uh, managed channels, it can also handle low balancing for you. So if you ever needed to low balance, uh, you know, on the client side. You can specify a load balancer factory on the client side where we can actually perform wrong robin load balancing for you. But if you want to load balance your request, what you also need is you need to know a logical name and how it maps to the actual server addresses. Because for a single service logical name, you may have 2, 10, 20, 100 different IP addresses you can possibly hit. So to do that, you can specify a implementation of a name resolver and what the name resolver needs to do is to turn that logical name into a list of ip and i have a additional code on this you can look it up in my github where i actually tied a name resolver into say eureka for name resolution okay and you can implement your own once i have this um channel let me uh, assign this to a variable Oh, channel. Once you have the channel, then you can start to consume it. And you can consume from a pre generated stub. And the stub is called uh, greeting so grpc. And I can create a new stub that will take in a channel. Now, again, look carefully here. This is cool. On the server side, we implement everything asynchronously. That is for performance. Um, but it is up to the client to decide whether the client wants to block the operation or not. So the client has a choice in terms of the stop that they create. So you can create a fully asynchronous stop by calling new stop. You can create a stop that returns the future um, by calling the new feature stop. You can also create a blocking stop instead. So let's use the blocking stop for this example. So I'm going to create the stop. Oops and assign this to a variable somehow by clicking on that. I'm going to call this stop. And because this is a greeting stop, what I can do is I can give it a request, just like how I envisioned the original stop would look like. And I'm going to uh, get back a response. Like, uh, oh, there we go. There we go. So I can get back a response. And this operation will then be blocking. And I can go ahead and do a system out.printline and I can print out the response. Okay. Now, in the request, what I can do then is to construct something uh, just with a builder. So, for example, I can set in the first name. I'm going to say I'm Ray. Uh, set the last name. Same. I can also set the age. Uh, it's a long value, but I'm just going to say I'm 18 for now. And um, remember all the uh, repeated fields? We added like a an array of uh, data or a map. 
Well, all of those things has convenient methods you can call. So you can say add hobbies. Uh, I can say photography, for example, and I can put something into the, the map, put back off the trick, uh, live coding, uh, definitely not good. All right, so that should be it. Um, and this is the moment where I find out uh, whether I can live code or not, because uh, I'm going to try to run this and we'll find out. So I have the server running here. Uh, here I'm just gonna say name and clean. So I'm gonna clean everything just to make sure I'm not cheating. I'm gonna package it up. I'm going to execute the, uh, the client side code and let's see what we get back. So here we go. Ah, there we go. It actually worked the first time, which is not bad. So it connected to the server. It sent in the request via gRPC over HTTP2, binary encoded. Uh, and here's the server side. And like I said, we implemented the, uh, the two strings, so you can see all the details here as well. Pretty nice, right? Now, that is actually too easy because, uh, you know, it's just request and response, right? But I really wanted to show you what that feels like. But the real power here is you can implement bidirectional streaming services, streaming services just as easily with exactly the same paradigm, okay? So to demonstrate, I'm going to do this fairly quickly in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to implement a chat server. In a chat room, a chat server, right, we can really leverage bidirectional streaming because the chat messages are coming in continuously and whenever a new chat message uh, appears, we need to broadcast it and send it out to all of the connected clients in a streaming fashion as well. So here is the video that I created to demonstrate this. So we have the payload chat message, which has the who sent it and what message is being sent. Uh, I created another payload just to uh, clarify that this response is actually coming from the server. Okay, so we have two types. And if you look at the definition of the service, I just add a stream to both ends, and now we have a bi-directional streaming service. Okay, and if you look closely on the top, we you can also import the types or messages from another proto file. You can import another IDL. And this is almost like importing a package in Java, right? You can import a package or a class from another package. And once you import it, you can actually refer and nest uh, those types as, the as if it's your own. And you can use these types to specify type safe, uh, type safe attributes as well, okay? And this is going to generate a stub for me that I can implement. Okay, so this is the server side stub. And if you look at this stub carefully, this is all generated for me, right? I added a few code here, but here's the trick. Because it is streaming both ways, what that means is I have to deal with stream observers both ways. And we have two observers here. That means there are two streams going on, okay? And there's where you really have to pay attention, okay? The request that's coming in to the server is going to be listened on by a stream observer. And that stream observer is what the server return because the server returns a callback uh, implementation where it's going to be listening to from the request, okay? So rather than having the request in, in the request parameter and the response in the response parameter, this is actually reversed. So the chat request parameter is actually an observer that you need to use to send data to the client, okay? So for me to implement this, I need to first of all return a new stream observer, okay? And this is what the server will be using to listen to the data coming from the client. Okay, so as the new message come from the client, it's going to trigger this on next. Okay, and then this is uh, receiving data from the client. When I receive the data from client, well, what do I need to do? I need to broadcast the, the message to every connected client here. And every connected client will be an instance of the response observer uh, that they, uh, they, they, they pass in from the request right here. So what I can do 
then you say, uh, I can uh, create a new chat message from the server. Uh, if I use the builder, right? And I can set the message to the chat message that just came in. And I can assign this to a variable called the uh, from server, message from the server. And then I can iterate through all the observers that I have. So I can use a string. I can say for each of the string uh, with the observer, I'm going to say o.onnext and the message from the server. And that will then send everything to the client. OK? And then you need to handle errors. If the client ever gives you an error, uh, it's going to trigger the on error callback. And uh, I'm going to do what all the good Java developers do. When you catch an error, we do nothing. All right. No, just kidding. In this case, we can do something else. Uh, we can disconnect the client so I can remove my current connection from the list of connections from the server. And we can do exactly the same thing uh, when the connection has been completed. And that should be it. That's all I need to do to implement the server side. So let me go ahead and run this. I'm going to run this uh, server, do a clean install. And there we go. My server should be up and running. Now, if you, in case you're wondering, what, what is second, he didn't implement the main class. Well, I actually implemented already, and because it takes so few lines of code, uh, it's exactly what we have done before. Okay, so that's all you need to do to register service and make this uh, service bidirectional. Okay, now the last thing I need to do is to show you this works. Uh, if I don't show you this works, uh, this could just be an empty uh, while loop uh, main class, right? But I want to show you this works. So to do that, I'm going to do a Maven clean. And um, on the client, I made this Java FX client, uh, GFX wrong. So this client does nothing right now, but uh, it is a Java FX uh, application. There it is. I can say Ray and hello. If I click on send, it should actually send a message to the server, to the chat room, and everybody else connected should be getting the message as well. Of course, this doesn't work right now because I haven't implemented it. Okay, whoa. So let me go back to the client, and this should be uh, fairly easy. Uh, so let's see. So in this code, um, I have a lot of bootstrapping codes just for JavaFX, but that's OK. Um, and then I have the channel, which I'm going to est establish to connect to the server. I can do that. I'm going hey, to create an asynchronous stop hey, in this case. So I'm going to call new stop, and this is a fully asynchronous stop. Yeah, fully, fully reactive. So what we can say is, well, let me create code the chat service and code the chat operation. Now here is where things really need to connect, because I need to pass in a stream observer here as well. And remember what this observer actually do. What is this stream? The stream is a, a stream of chat messages that the server sends to me. Okay, so whenever a server sent me a message, it's going to trigger this on next. And when I receive this message, what I want to do is to Ray. add it to the list of messages. Yeah. Ray, your screen is not being shared right now. Oh, it is not. Oh, let me uh, try this again. Yeah, it cut out just a minute ago. There yeah, I thought the uh, Java FX thing really uh, turned that thing off. Uh, there we go. Are we sharing? Yep, you're good. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. So now we're actually um, implementing the, the, the on next uh, to, I want to display the message on the Java FX client. So to do that, I need to do a uh, platform that run later uh, because I cannot touch the UI, uh, the background thread and UI threads um, at the same time. So I need to do this later. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add messages. I'm going to add a new message. And the message will be something like, uh, I'm going to say string.format uh, will be the from. And the message itself, right? And yeah. and what does that look like? Well, I have the chat message from the server. It's going to get the message and get the front. And also, um, I'm going to get the message payload as well. OK, so that should just, whenever a new chat message arrives, it's going to trigger an annex. It's going to add the message to the list. And that will then render in uh, JavaFX in the, uh, in the client side, OK? Now here, if I catch an arrow, um, I'm really going to do nothing at this moment for now, OK? And when the server term is, terminates my connection, I'm going to do nothing as well, OK? That's it. Yay. That's receiving the stream. 
Now I need to actually send the data in in a stream as well. So what I can do is I'm going to assign this to yet another observer, okay? But this observer is really uh, listening to uh, by the server. So I'm gonna say this is uh, to server, okay? So whenever I need to send something to the server, I gotta use this callback on next. And I can construct the chat message like that. I can use the builder, I can build in this message. I need to set the from, from the name field. Okay, I need to set message from the message field. And whenever I trigger this callback, it's going to send this new chat message to the server. And I only want to do this if when my send button is clicked on. So I'm going to say, if the button is clicked on, set on action, I get an event. Okay. And whenever somebody click on the button, I'm going to send the data to the server, just like that. And I think that should be it. This is how easily I can implement a bidirectional service and also implement a real client consuming it. Um, so let's see if that works. So I'm gonna run Java FX again. I'm not sure this is going to crash the sharing. So let's try it. Okay. Oh, there we go. I think sharing just died. Um, so the share died? No, still sharing, good. No, so, there you go, there you go, you're good. Okay, good. So I should be able to say Ray and say hello uh, and click on send and there you go. You can see that the message was returned to me, right? I can say, phew, that worked. There you go. Okay, but that's only just one client. What I wanna do is to make sure this works with multiple clients. So I'm gonna run another GFX uh, client here. Let's see. Okay, so hopefully I'm still sharing. Okay, and you should be able to see this. I'm gonna just be, uh, I'm gonna be my manager. Uh, his name is Greg. I'm gonna say, great job, Ray. All right, and there you go. And now I have bi-directional streaming with multiple clients. Yeah, why? Thank you, Greg. Yeah, there you go. And I can chat with myself as long as I want, but I'm not gonna do that, okay? So <laughs> hopefully this kind of shows you how we can uh, create the service very easily in gRPC and you can stream data now, which is not something you can easily do with the RESTful services. Now, let me go back to this slide. Um, just one more thing I wanna talk about. Um, here we go, uh, streaming, yay. So we talk about that, but there's something even better. Uh, gRPC was really designed um, from ground up to reflect many of the use cases that you know Google internally have faced. And one of the biggest challenges that we had was to make sure that we respond to the client uh, within certain uh, deadline constraints, right? So you can actually specify a deadline. What that means is if you have like a search service, of some sort, uh, you just type in the query, you say search. Well, maybe we want to restrict that to you know just one second. I want everything to be responded within a second, right? So I need to set a deadline. I can say uh, the search service can respond only within a second, but the search service is going to call multiple other services in parallel, right? And some of these other children services that we call uh, could take longer than one second. And then those, services will call yet another service. So you have nested services. So in gRPC, when you set the deadline, the deadline is actually propagated through all of the service call layers downstream. So if the search service, the top service can only take a second and the second service took half a second and the third one took say, um, you know, another half a second, then your, your time is almost up. And if the downstream took more than a second, this entire call will be uh, canceled and you can listen to these cancellation uh, events as well, right? So if you are doing parallel processing, and if one of the, the servers doesn't respond to you in time, if that's okay, um, then you can just respond whatever you got already to the client. Uh, you can also implement interceptors. These are like filters in the ser servlet. And you can also propagate data like uh, tokens or authentication tokens uh, from one service to another via the headers, okay? So there's a lot more to this and uh, we can address a lot of the microservices concerns. Um, if you're interested, uh, definitely, definitely let me know. Uh, one of the most frequently asked questions is, can you do server-side 
load balancing and then answer is yes, there are some of the things you can use to do that. And the reason I love doing this is that um, I, mean, I really want to see uh, you trying uh, out gRPC. So if you like to do that, go ahead and go to gRPC.io and uh, you can check out my demos and code on GitHub. And most importantly, if you are able to contribute, if you have feedback, please check out gRPC IO Contribute. Uh, we love to hear your experiences and feedback and seeing your contributions as well. So um, thank you for your time and uh, thanks for having me here, Diane. Cool. And that's all I have. I'm going to stop the sharing for now. And I see uh, many chat messages. There are a couple of questions here, um, and I'm definitely going to watch this again on a slower speed um, so that I can follow some of the, the typing. It, that You packed in a lot in an hour. Um, there was an early question around um, uh, what Peter asked was, so is there a, a Marshall, unmarshall effect in given each language package packages data differently? Um, and uh, marshall marshall effect um, i'm not quite clear on the um uh the the, the nature of the question though but um the, but the, the, the binary, formats, payload, so. binary format is interoperable between multiple languages and when we marshal and marshal into those languages we'll make sure that it is the same in that language right um so but that means I, you're doing a decoding between them just like you would do from text it's just a different type of decoding Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So the decoding is going to be uh, based on the binary format. But in Protobuf 3, uh, this is something that's, re that, that's really, really cool that they're doing, uh, which is um, zero copy. So when you're decoding something, if you know um, the, the structure up front, because we do, because we have this predefined, uh, then potentially you can have just zero copy decoding. What that means is rather than you know mapping everything into a new POJO and just copy you know, recopy the strings over and over again, you can just point to that byte first and, and there you go. Okay. But different languages will potentially behave a little bit differently. Now, that being said, uh, there's a public uh, dashboard in terms of, uh, it actually shows you the gRPC performances across multiple languages. And that is a really nice dashboard. You can find it on gRPC.io. You can see the performance differences between different languages in that case. Because yes, there, there may be some overhead in different languages as well. Cool. Okay. So there, there was one other one a little bit further down. Um, Judd was asking, are there concurrency semantics to manage transaction type situations, async and sync? Uh, transactions, I see. Yes, so you got to be careful with concurrency. <laughs> uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, and you handle it just like uh, everything else. And you could probably assume that once you're in that callback, right? Once once your thing got code, uh, it's, it has its own thread local, right? It's in its own thread. So um, what you want to do is to, like, if you have anything uh, that you want to pass between services within, uh, say, the same transaction or the same code within the, ser the same server boundary, you have to use a context propagation in that case. Uh, but essentially what that uh, hides behind the scenes is the thread locals that they store behind the scenes. Okay, let's see. That might be all of the questions um, dun, 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 that I'm seeing. Ray, could you throw back up on the screen? Oh, no, there's one tag follow-up from Judd. So the tagging between gRPC and language concurrency is left to the developer. Just confirming that. Uh, the tagging is definitely left to the developer. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Right. Um, and concurrency, I mean, we will, like, the gRPC server will manage uh, multiple threads behind the scenes. I mean, you, as all developers, right, everyone needs to be aware of concurrency regardless, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So if you could put your last screen with your how to connect with you details back up, share that. Um, yeah. I managed to do this whole thing tethered to my iPhone oh, that's um, great. without losing power and power has not come back into my house yet. So oh, um, no. <laughs> and, and I still have 16% left on my laptop, so nothing has died. So that's a really good sign. That's um, really lucky for me. Yeah. And I did put up and I will, when I blog with this, the, um, the link to download the IntelliJ plugin for OpenShift and Kubernetes. So um, for folks who are 
looking to do all this and deploy directly to OpenShift um, and Kubernetes, there's there's a great way to do this. I I got to say I love um, the name resolving in IntelliJ and and everything there too. So um, great demo of, of their their product um, and and might almost might make me want to program in Java again, but doubtful. Um, <laughs> as a Python programmer, I can appreciate it. But um, so thank, thanks so much, Ray. Um, we definitely will have you back as the uh, doing when the next round of uh, things and features come out in gRPC and um, look forward to running into you or maybe crossing tracks in Germany uh, as you're going over there and we're going over there for two different events. But um, yeah. if you can make it to the, the, the OpenShift Commons Day um, next Tuesday in Berlin, We'd love yep. to have you there as well. Um, if you can sneak out of, where's your comp? Which conference are you going to? Uh, Java Land, and that's yeah. closer to Frankfurt. Yeah. 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 Everything's just a train ride in Europe. Far. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Cool. All right. So thanks again. It was a great um, and very a great demo and a good way to get a, an overview on um, gRPC. So um, we really appreciate it and look forward to hearing more from you. Yeah. So, Thank you. All right. Bye.